uh, telephone company security people. The phone freeze conferences were soon buzzing with stories about investigations by phone company agents, in particular the notorious Mr. Duffy. Well, Mr. Duffy decided that he would pay Bill a visit. Mm -hmm. Bill's mother didn't feel like uh, keeping Mr. Duffy from doing anything, you see. One of the chief special agents used to talk to me sometimes. He also talked to my dad sometimes in you know, hopes, of course, of getting me to... Yeah, to quit. And then, of course, Duffy visited Bill at his school and died. I don't think Bill said anything. I guess, you know, we'd stop for a little while, but then it's the old thing. You had fun doing it, and you kind of go back and do it again. Mr. Duffy would soon be eclipsed by a far greater threat, nationwide media exposure, thanks to New York journalist Ron Rosenbaum. It was like entering this uh, Alice in Wonderland uh, electronic outlaw underground. They were sending messages outside the accepted channels, but they're also inventing hacker sensibility. I think one thing the, uh, the phone freaks responded to was a kind of generalized paranoia about phones and about communication. I think because of the, uh, the anti-war movement um, and FBI, reaction to that, everyone thought their phones were being uh, tapped. The phone was sort of a focus for a kind of generalized uh, paranoia about government intrusion, lack of privacy, that sort of thing. Rosenbaum tracked down Denny and Joe and Gracia, but Captain Crunch proved elusive. Captain Crunch is like one of the great American characters, a homegrown superhero fantasy. Everybody that Ron Rosenbaum interviewed, they talked about Captain Crunch. So I called him and I said, hey, look, we would really like you not to publish this article because it's really not a good thing. Captain Crunch was very worried about this because he kept telling me, you know, whatever you do, I don't want this information to get into the hands of the radical underground because he felt that it could paralyze the phone system in the U.S. and somehow uh, bring, a, bring upon nuclear surrender by the U.S. to the, the Soviet Union. In October 1971, Ron Rosenbaum's article on phone freaks was published in Esquire magazine. I went to the library and I read, I read the article and I, my, just my, I couldn't believe it. It was just so exposing. I said, oh my God. And I knew right then and there that phone's leaking. If I knew it was ended. I read it to Denny over the phone, the whole thing. And everybody got on a conference call. One of the last conference calls we had and I read the article to everybody because they couldn't read it and they couldn't believe it. I said, you guys really screwed up. You guys shouldn't have let this guy talk to you. Shouldn't have given this guy all this information. After the Esquire article, everyone jumped on the bandwagon. Hey, everybody! Whose number is 237 These parasites piled on afterwards, mainly for the idea of stealing, um, in some cases, uh, just like youthful vandalism, you know, you know, hey, I'm doing something wrong, isn't that cool? But in other cases, for profit. In our uh, uh, accelerated program to catch phone freaks, uh, which is uh, more successful all the time, uh, we find that we, uh, we detect people who are businessmen, uh, we find uh, private detectives, stockbrokers, uh, automobile dealers. Uh, we've even found some, uh, some members of organized crime. The backlash hit the pioneers of phone freaking as hard as it hit the parasites. The LA people got busted. The Seattle people got busted. The New York people got busted. They came in. They had grand jury investigations coming in. They came to visit me, gave me a search warrant, searched my place. Since I wasn't really as heavily into it as some I just got like a 10 day, uh, 10 day in jail three years probation that was suspended. And of course, everybody that got busted had my number. And I was, I was made the kingpin because of the article. The authorities came down hard. Possession of a blue box could get you two years in jail. It was that one unlucky time that I just happened to have it. I get out of the car, right? And three cars went. One in front of my car, one in the back of my car, two in the side of the car, and the FBI just jumped and grabbed me right there. Captain Crunch was federally indicted for wire fraud and served a total of four months in jail. I was the black hat hacker, uh, only for phones. I was like the bad, evil 
guy. Phone freaking was dead, but not buried. A worldwide revolution in technology was about to explode, and Captain Crunch would be there to inspire a whole new generation of hackers. Hacking had begun as the playful exploration of the phone network, but this was all about to change with the invention of the personal computer, a revolution in technology inspired by the hackers themselves. Key to the whole revolution was a young engineering student called Steve Wozniak, whose world had been turned upside down by the Esquire article on blue boxing. It was the most amazing article I'd ever read. It was about engineers and technical people like myself outsmarting phone companies and setting up networks that nobody imagined existed. Wozniak was so enthused by the article that he set about building his own blue box. At first, I was just sticking some chips of my own design into a little, a little blank board and soldering wires onto them. So when I got the blue box built, some of the tones were right and some were wrong. So we started looking for Captain Crunch. After his cover had been blown by Esquire, John Draper was trying to keep a low profile. He'd even stopped his occasional appearances on local pirate radio. Everyone said John Draper was Captain Crunch. So we put a call into the radio station. We asked for John Draper to call us. And they said, oh, he dropped out of sight right after the Esquire article. And we knew we had the right one. Ten minutes later, the phone rang. I said, oh, my God, this is bad news. It was him, and he said he'd come up to Berkeley to meet us in the dorm. And I felt like, you know, like if you were bringing the president home. I, I kind of walked into this thing not really knowing what was going on and was wanted me to show him how to use the blue box. He just built it. This guy was supposed to be, in my mind, so suave with the girls. And when he showed up at the door, he didn't quite fit the image I had in my head. But he said, I am he, Captain Crunch. And I said, look, you guys, uh, I really don't think I want to do this. He said, it's cool, it's cool. God, I felt like a hero. I said, well, I guess, uh, I guess it'll be okay because I'm in, the, I'm in a dorm and it'd be pretty hard to like, track any one person making this call. And Juan says, can we call the Pope? I said, I guess so. So I got the number to the Vatican and we called the Vatican and we asked for the Pope. And he said, well, the Pope's not available right now. <laughs> it's like four in the morning started learning learning um codes that night from uh from john draper and from other people and techniques to use and talking operators into things and started practicing on my own over the weeks and seeing what i could couldn't accomplish and th i think i was kind of scared that i could get caught a couple of weeks later wozniak's car broke down luckily he and his college buddy steve jobs happened to have their blue box with them We'll try to make a blue box call back to our friends in Berkeley because they can drive us home. And Steve made a blue box call, and the operator came on the line, and he hung up all scared. And then made the call again, and she came on the line, and he hung up. And he was just scared, and a cop showed up. He was inside the, the phone with a box in his hand. Oh, my God. The cop probably thought we were like druggies because I had long hair. Steve managed to pass me the blue box, and I got it in my coat pocket and said, what's this? Well, if you push the buttons, they all made tones. So I said, it's an electronic music synthesizer. The cop said, sounds out of tune to me. He says, what's the orange button for? That's the one you see his phone lines with. So Steve said, that's for calibration. He said, what well, needs calibrating? This is scary. We, were, we knew we were caught. They got us in their car, two cops in the front seat, Steve and I in the back, and the cop in the passenger seat turned around. And the cop hands it back to Laz and says, a guy by the name of Moog beat you to it. Moog synthesizer. While Steve Wozniak and Captain Crunch were messing about with phones, the big boys at the corporations in nearby Silicon Valley were making great advances in computer technology. But in the early 70s, computers were still vast impersonal machines serving vast impersonal corporations. Computers were started you know, for code breaking, tracking missiles, wartime uses. You know, and that really is the origin of where the modern computer came from. And then it moved to these big business database you know, complications. Computers had been seen as uh, things to never touch, uh, never even be in the same room with a computer. Keep your distance, 